Hey guys, Jay here with Word of Advice TV and today I want to talk about 10 reasons why your furnace can be overheating. So a lot of times it's pretty easy to track down the source of the overheating, but there are times where it gets pretty tricky and it takes a long time to figure out why. So hopefully this video will help you track down the source of your overheating problem and get it fixed. So let's begin our list and this list is in no particular order, but I will start with the most common reason why a furnace overheats. And you probably already guessed it, but the most common reason why a furnace overheats is a dirty furnace filter. And I'm guilty of this myself too. I understand these things are very easy to forget about. You don't think about your furnace every day, but if you don't replace your furnace filter for a while, it'll start to restrict the airflow and that will cause your furnace to overheat. And just so you know, these filters should be replaced on a monthly basis or at most every two months. You don't wanna leave them in there longer because then your furnace will start to overheat. Some of these filters will actually say on them that it's up to three months. And really when they say three months, your house would have to be super clean, no dust, and maybe between the transition period, you know, between summer and winter, where you're not really using your furnace or your AC. In that case, yes, your filter would last longer because your blower motor is not coming on as often. And one recommendation I like to make to people who are having overheating issues is to not use premium grade filters. Usually it'll be an accordion like this, but it'll be a lot more closely knit together. See how this one's more spaced out? The premium grade ones, I mean, first of all, they look different and they also will cost like 15 or 20 bucks, whereas this one's only three bucks a piece. And those premium grade filters, they don't actually filter that much more, but they do cause a lot more of an air restriction on the furnace and that causes a lot of furnaces to overheat. And I personally don't really like the fiberglass filters, you know, the ones that are either blue or green. They tend to let a little too much through. And once you have too much dust going through, then whatever gets past the filter ends up settling on top of your, or I should say below your evaporator coil or the A coil. And if that gets plugged up, your furnace will start to overheat as well. And just one last note about the filter. One side does not have a wire net on both filters and the other side does have a wire net. The wire net always goes towards the furnace. And reason number two is that dirty A-coil that I just mentioned previously. Your A-coil, if you have an upflow furnace in Minnesota where I live, that's a very common setup where the A-coil will be sitting on top of the furnace. And if you're not sure where your A-coil is or the evaporator coil, just look for your refrigeration lines if you have an air conditioner. Uh, these are my refrigeration lines right here see where they come into and that's where your A-coil is going to be behind the sheet metal here or the plenum. You're also going to have a condensate drain coming out of the bottom of it too. And this A-coil, the reason it's called an A-coil is because most of the time it's shaped like a letter A, like a triangle, and it looks like a radiator, almost like the unit you have sitting outside, your condenser unit or the air conditioner that's outside. You know how with time it gets plugged up with dust and leaves and whatever else? Same thing happens with your A-coil. You know, whatever gets past the filter will inevitably end up plugging up your coil up on top here. So as the air is going through your furnace, through the heat exchanger, that air is supposed to absorb the heat and bring it to the rest of your house. But when that coil starts to get plugged up, not enough air is able to get past it. So that heat starts to get trapped inside the furnace. And as it gets hotter and hotter, that trips your high limit switch and turns off the burners. And there's a couple of ways of how you can check if your coil is dirty or not. One way is by using these static pressure test tubes. The ones I have, they come with six foot hoses, so you can check the total system pressure. This is what they look like right here. It's basically metal tubes with holes in the end, so air can come in. And you plug them in to a manometer that can read pressure, inches of water column or PSI. So you would plug these hoses into your manometer, both of them. And the cool thing about this is the back is magnetic and these handles right here, or the base of the tubes are magnetic as well. So after you put them in, it'll magnetize to whatever you stick it into. And the rule of thumb for these is that you want the test tube pointing towards the airflow where the air is coming from. But anyways, for example, if you wanted to check your filter, I've checked before the fiberglass filter, the medium grade filter, and then that premium grade filter. And yes, I mean, the fiberglass is the least restrictive, the medium grade is medium, and that premium one 
is usually twice or three times as restrictive as that medium grade pleated filter. To check that, I would just simply put my test probe in front of the filter and after the filter and see what my static pressure drop is on my manometer in inches of water column. But this is not what this video is about, so I'm not gonna get too deep into that. But that's how you check the filter. To check the coil, I generally prefer to check the coil, just the coil itself. You can also check the total system pressure where you put your test probe on top of the A-coil and one before the filter. But I prefer to measure just the A-coil by itself and usually that's best done on the back side of the furnace. To check the static pressure on my coil, I would usually put one probe before the A-coil and one after. Now there's like a little base in the middle of the coil, so I usually don't go in the middle usually either one side or the other, left or right. And in my case, the coil sits right on top of the furnace. So really, if I drill a hole somewhere in here, I'll probably put a hole in my drain pan, or even worse, I'll puncture one of the refrigerant lines and have refrigerant spewing all over. So be really careful where you're drilling. If you get lucky, your A-coil is a little bit more raised and you can actually stick a tube in there. You could also stick your tube into the high limit. If you take the high limit out, you can stick it in there. Um, sometimes, I don't do this very often either, you can also drill the hole in your actual furnace cabinet in the back. So I would look where the burners come in and where the burners are shooting the flames in, that's where your heat exchanger cells are going to be. So you can kind of gauge where they will be in the back here too. I've never hit a heat exchanger before any times that I've drilled it, but you basically drill a hole on the back of the cabinet very carefully, just the surface metal right here, drill that through and then take like a thermometer or a screwdriver and poke it in there and make sure that the heat exchanger is not there. Usually right behind the surface metal, there will be a layer of insulation too, just so you're aware. So I would put one tube in here and another tube up on top. And usually if I have a really dirty coil, I'll get readings that are about 0.7 or 0.9, somewhere in that range. If I'm getting like 1.2, then that's totally plugged. On a normally operating furnace, that coil, you should only have a 0.15 static pressure drop across that coil. But I am sidetracking from the main purpose of this video. Let's get back to our reasons why the furnace overheats. Checking the static pressure is not my preferred method. This is just my opinion, but to me it seems like it's not always an accurate reading. So I would rather visibly verify if that coil is clean or not by actually looking at it, either with an inspection camera or getting underneath the furnace, if it's an 80% furnace, and looking at it that way. So for example, I have an inspection camera here. These things, I mean, they vary in price. Of course, the bigger the screen, the more it's gonna cost, the more functions it has, the more it's gonna cost. On Amazon, they can be anywhere from, you know, 50 bucks to all the way up to $600. Depends on how awesome of an inspection camera you want. But the best way to check an A-coil with an inspection camera is through the high limit switch. And I just want to show you quick how I would do it. Of course, make sure your power is off because there's two wires going to the high limit. Then you just take it out. Usually it's just two screws holding it. It'll either be a black box like that, black square I should say. or it'll be just a silver circular or oval shaped limit, which will be typically on top of the burner or below the burner. So you take that switch out and you got a nice hole right there where you can stick your inspection camera snake in. So the way I like to do this is I like to form my snake, it's a rigid snake, so it kind of keeps its form after you bend it. So for example, I want to look at the coil, right? So I will probably go like this. And since I have a lot of room here, I'll do that. That way I'll gonna, I'm gonna stick it in and just look straight up at my coil. That way I don't have to try to bend it after it's already in. All right, so I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see that on the camera, but there's my evaporator coil. As you can see, there's some dust there. It's not terrible. I would say that's like half plugged. So actually, I probably do need to clean that up sometime soon. 
I haven't really had a problem with the furnace overheating as long as I replace my filters. So I probably will procrastinate on that a little bit, but that's a partially plugged coil. Sometimes these things are totally caked though. And if it's totally plugged, then of course the furnace will be overheating really quickly. And while I have my camera in there, this is a great way to check your heat exchanger too. Because your heat exchanger cells are right behind that high limit too. So if you look at the camera here, once again, I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to see it. But here's a rivet from a heat exchanger. Sometimes these things fall out. Right there. If you see a rivet that fell out, see that metal ridge on that heat exchanger? Sometimes that thing will, with time, it'll just start corroding and fall off. If that's off there, that's actually a compromised heat exchanger if that rivet falls out. So that's condemnable. You could just keep going, snaking in there and just look at those heat exchanger cells and see if you can find any cracks. Um, so if you suspect that your heat exchanger is cracked somewhere, this is one way that you can look and see with an inspection camera. But anyways, this is not what this video is about. We are not finding a crack in my heat exchanger. But this is my favorite method of checking the A-coil. And as you saw, it's a very good method. I mean, you see that coil very well by going in through the high limit. And these things can be a little expensive. Um, I know a lot of guys at my job, my co-workers, they use endoscopes for their cell phones, which are a lot cheaper. They're probably like 20, 30 bucks. I bought one off of eBay and Amazon, and both of them didn't work on my phone. So I don't know, maybe it's just me having a problem with it. It seems to be working great for them. They just hook it up to their phone, their smartphones, and they can just snake it in there and look at it on their phone, which is really slick. But I haven't had much luck making it work on my phone. And one more way that you can look at your A-coil is by pulling out the blower wheel. I'm not gonna pull out my blower wheel this time, but basically, I mean, in my case, I would have to take off the door switch, the control board, and the blower motor housing here take this whole thing out and then I would actually lay down on my back facing upwards I would take this whole thing out lay down on my back and look up and usually you can see right through that heat exchanger cells and right into that a coil and you can actually just visually with a flashlight you don't even need an inspection camera look up there and see if your coil is plugged or not and that's also a great way of looking for cracks or holes in the heat exchanger too you can just pull the blower and investigate visually once again with your flashlight just by laying under there but just a heads up this will only work on 80 percent furnaces or the ones with the steel vent if you have a high efficiency furnace with the plastic venting you'll have a secondary heat exchanger which will be between the blower motor and that primary heat exchanger and that will block your view from everything else so if you have a high efficiency furnace then there's no point for you to pull the blower wheel and get under there unless you just want to look at the secondary heat exchanger all right, well, that's enough about the A-coil. Moving on to number three. Number three on the list is a bad blower motor. So if for some reason your blower motor is not turning on, let's say the blower motor is burnt out, then your furnace, of course, will overheat because the flames are on, but there's no airflow going through it, so the furnace overheats. A lot of times if a blower motor burnt out, you'll smell some kind of a burnt electrical smell throughout the house and especially around the furnace. And then if you just take off your furnace door and reach in there, and just touch the blower motor. It's usually gonna be on the right side. Just touch the motor itself. A lot of times it'll be really hot if the motor burnt out. So in my case, it's right there. And while we're looking at it, there's the capacitor as well. Another reason why the blower motor might not be starting is because the capacitor is either really weak or dead. And the capacitor is pretty much like a car battery for a car. It's like a battery for the fan motor. So if the capacitor is fully dead, then that motor will not run. But from what I see in the field, usually if that capacitor is fully dead, that means the blower motor is already damaged. So even if you replace just the capacitor, chances are like a month down the road, you're gonna be replacing that motor anyway. So if I find dead capacitors on the job, I just replace the motor and the capacitor right away. And it's also possible that your blower motor is actually weak and those are a little harder to catch. I've had a furnace where I had to go back to it a couple times because the furnace kept overheating. And every time I would come there, I would run it for like 20, 30 minutes and the furnace was just fine. So the third time when I came back, I sat there and watched the furnace for 45 minutes. And after 45 minutes, you can actually hear it ramping down just mm, until it completely stopped. 
And of course, after the blower motor stopped, then the furnace overheated. But it took it a whole 45 minutes to do that. So those are a little bit trickier to catch. But of course, the windings inside that blower motor were going bad. I replaced the blower motor and never got called back there again. And one last thing about the blower motor, you also have the squirrel cage, which is that big blower wheel. Sometimes that squirrel cage, especially if you have fiberglass filters or if you forgot to replace your filters or if you forget to replace them quite often, that blower wheel, the fins on there, will get completely caked. And checking that is very easy. You just reach in there carefully because those fins can be sharp. Just reach in there and with your finger, go between each blade and just kind of feel between them. If there's a lot of dust, you'll feel it. And I actually have a video where I replaced my blower motor on this furnace. And when I took this whole thing out, my blower wheel was filthy. And in that video, I show how I cleaned it up. So if you're interested, you could check out that video where I replaced my blower motor and cleaned that wheel. And number four is a weak high limit. That's the limit that I took out earlier. What happens is with time, or if your furnace overheats a lot for some reason, let's say you're bad at replacing your filter, for example, that limit will get weak and it'll open ahead of time. So for example, my limit is supposed to open up at 190 degrees. If the furnace ever gets to 190 inside there, the furnace will trip that limit and turn off the burners. But if my limit is weak, then it might be opening at 170 degrees instead. So even though my furnace is not actually overheating, that high limit opens up and turns off the burners anyway. To check for that is pretty simple. All you have to do is look on your furnace uh, name sheet or where you have all the data. And on my furnace, if you look for the temperature drop, just look somewhere for a temperature word. So on my furnace, for example, it says air temperature rise. So just look for the temp rise or temperature rise and see what the numbers are. In my case, on my furnace, it's 30 to 60 degrees. So once you know what your temperature rise is gonna be, then you just check what you actually have going in your furnace. You can put one thermometer in your return duct. I usually actually put my thermometer in the canvas on the return, or if you have a vent or a register somewhere here and here, usually it's the canvas on the return. You measure what you have. So for example, let's say I have 70 degrees the house air coming in in my return. So I have 70 degrees coming out and then I put my thermometer into here, for example, drill a hole and put it into here or put it in my canvas. Let's say on my supply duct, I have about 130 degrees coming out. So at that point you would do your math, 70 going down and 130 coming out, that's a 60 degree difference. And my temp rise should be between 30 and 60. So I'm already on the higher end there, being at 60 degrees. If I'm getting like 140 or 150, that will be an 80 degree temp rise. And that's telling us that the furnace is overheating. So if you measure the temperatures between your supply and return, and that difference between them falls into that range of what your furnace is designed for, that means your furnace should not be overheating. There can be other reasons why it's overheating, but for the most part, if your furnace is overheating, even though your temperatures are good, Usually that means your high limit is just weak and should be replaced. And number five on the list is a humidifier. If you have a bypass humidifier, like I do right here, this humidifier is bringing air through this duct right here from my supply back into my return. So of course that heats up my return air and makes it hotter going into the furnace. So if the air going in is hotter, it'll be hotter coming out. Now from what I've seen, usually it's not the humidifier's fault. It's typically a combination of things. For example, either your A-coil is partially plugged or you have a dirty filter and that's what's causing your furnace to overheat. But I have had times where I turned the humidifier damper off to stop the furnace from overheating. And number six is high gas pressure. So this will usually be on newer furnaces. So for some reason when the furnace was installed, maybe the gas pressure was left a little too high, it wasn't adjusted. And of course you should only be touching your gas valve if you actually know what you're doing. You have some kind of an HVAC background, otherwise you can make things worse. Um, but anyways, most gas valves are adjustable. They have a little access port. You would need a manometer like this with the hose and the fitting. And gas valves will have a plug on the manifold side where the tube comes out for the burners. There's the plug. You would take it out with an Allen wrench and put this fitting in and it should read 3.5 inches of water column while the furnace is running. I have a two-stage furnace so on low fire 
my gas pressure should be 1.7 inches of water column and on high fire it should be 3.5 and I have been to houses before where the furnace is overheating and when I checked my gas pressure the gas pressure was like 4.5 or 4.8 and when it's set that high the furnace runs a lot hotter than it should in that case I just decreased the gas pressure to 3.5 and that takes care of the problem and number seven is a bad control board so if your board for some reason is not sending power to the blower motor then of course that blower motor will not turn on and your furnace will overheat in no time if you have a multimeter you can check if your control board is sending 120 volts to your blower motor if you don't have a meter then there is a way where you can just send 120 volts directly to the motor just to check if it's the board that's bad or the actual blower motor that's bad and I have a whole video that explains how to do that and how to check that so if you'd like check that out but primarily if the board is bad and it's causing the furnace to overheat it'll be the board not sending power to the blower motor when it should and reason number eight is blocked or closed vents your returns that's the ones that are sucking air in those should always be open once in a while I see people put like a couch in front of it or a box in front of it and that'll block a return especially if it's a big one if your furnace does not have enough return air coming in it'll overheat really fast one way to check if your furnace is not getting enough return air is to tape your door switch and then turn your furnace on put your door the bottom door back on and as the blower motor is running as the furnace is running just start pulling back that door a little bit and feel how much resistance you're getting it is normal for the door to pull back in but if it's literally like slamming back in to the point where it's kind of even hard to pry it off that means your furnace is starving for air so if I suspect that there's not enough return air that's one test I do so for example if the furnace is overheating I'll take that bottom door off and just leave it off and let the furnace run if the furnace stops overheating with that bottom door off that means there's not enough return air either one of the return grills is blocked or they simply just don't have enough returns and they need to add one or two of them to the return duct as for the registers or the vents that are blowing air out most of those should remain open you shouldn't close too many of them off you can close a couple but you shouldn't be closing like half of the house the rule of thumb for that is you don't want to have more than a third of your vents closed off so for example if you have let's say 21 vents in your house the most the maximum that you should be closing is seven but if possible it's best to just leave them all open so that's another test I will do if I come to a customer's house and the furnace is overheating and I'm having trouble finding what's causing it if I ask the customer how many vents they have closed and they say they have like the whole basement shut off then I go ahead and open all those vents and run the furnace with all the vents open and see how it runs and I have had plenty of times where opening the vents stopped the furnace from overheating because if the furnace does not have enough exit points where it can push the air out then there's more heat staying inside of the furnace and of course that causes the furnace to overheat and number nine is a bad heat exchanger either the primary heat exchanger or if you have a high efficiency furnace the secondary heat exchanger can be bad as well I have had times where the furnace was overheating and when I checked my carbon monoxide emissions they were like 5,000 parts per million which is super high and that also means that there's incomplete combustion so that heat exchanger was getting a lot hotter than it should be so if I'm on a furnace call and I'm having troubles figuring out why it's overheating then I also check my carbon monoxide emissions coming out my exhaust pipe just to make sure that I don't have a bad heat exchanger but another thing to check is dirty burners if you have in shop burners it'll be the faces of them or if you have the big long ribbon burners because if there's a lot of rust and buildup on those burners that can also cause the furnace to overheat that's pretty rare I don't see that very often usually that'll just cause your carbon monoxide emissions to go up but I seldom see that cause the furnace to overheat but I have seen that before so that's just another thing to check just to make sure that the burners themselves are not really dirty and of course if there's a crack or a hole in the heat exchanger that could cause the high limit to trip as well because what does the heat exchanger do it separates the house air from the combustion gases going outside and those combustion gases especially on the 80 percent furnaces are really hot they get to like 400 degrees and I've actually burnt myself lots of times by accidentally touching this exhaust pipe while the furnace is running but if there's a crack or a hole in the heat exchanger somewhere around that high limit those combustion gases are going to start escaping into your house air and if it's right by that high limit that can cause that high limit to overheat really quick too and finally reason number 10 is a weak inducer motor 
And these can be kind of tricky to track down as well. Just like that blower motor that I mentioned, where I had to watch it for 45 minutes until it finally died down and stopped. So if you have a weak inducer motor, the longer it runs, the hotter it'll get. And eventually it'll get to a point where, just like that blower motor, it'll just stop working. And I had a couple of times where as the inducer motor is slowing down, it doesn't just turn right off. It just gradually starts to slow down. So as the inducer motor is gradually slowing down, that pressure difference is not quite there yet where it will trip the pressure switch. Yet, the exhaust fumes are not coming out as fast as they were, which can cause the furnace to overheat. This is a really rare problem. It only happened to me a couple times where a weak inducer motor was causing the furnace to overheat. But it does happen, and if you find yourself running out of options and you can't find what's going on, then perhaps that inducer motor is going bad. Well, and that concludes my list of 10 reasons why the furnace may be overheating. If you know of any other reasons that I may have missed, please share with us in the comments below. Or if you have some stories, some interesting stories of the furnace overheating and you were able to figure out why, we would love to hear about that as well. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to mash that like button on the way out and we'll see you next time. And for those of you still here, you can watch me do this little experiment. I bought a high limit off of Amazon. This is the oval shaped one. The way the most high limits work, there's a little metal disc that warps and kind of pops and that trips the circuit. So with this limit, that little disc is right here. So I am actually going to put a lighter under it and see how that thing pops. So hopefully you'll be able to see on the camera how that looks like. I don't know if you heard that, but it just popped in. But basically what I'm doing is simulating an overheating situation in your furnace. So if it's getting too hot, that heat will cause that little bimetal disc to trip. So if I put it on an ice pack, this should cause it to pop back out. So let's just give it a little bit. Just snap back out right there. And sometimes what happens is this little disc, it'll get stuck in that snap position and it will not pop back out. That's the case where you would need to take a screwdriver and just swap it a couple of times or just take the switch out altogether and just smack it against the floor to try to free that disc up. And I was also curious to see what the inside looks like. So I just broke this top little piece off right here. And here you have your bimetal. So that disc that was popping in, I'm going to press in on it and take a look at what happens on the top here. As you can see, that thing pops up and interrupts the circuit. So you have your two wires coming in here and the other wire coming out of here. So when your furnace overheats, this little bimetal switch pops open and interrupts the circuit until the furnace cools back off. And of course we're going to try to overheat it one more time with this cap off so we can actually see what's going on. So let's start the roasting. It just popped open. And actually, this little metal tab does not go up very far. It just slightly interrupts the circuit. And it is low voltage, it's just 24 volts, so it's not like it's going to arc. I thought it would pop up a little further up, but it does not. It just barely pops open. So this time, instead of the ice pack, I just smacked it against the floor a couple times, and that closed right back up. So let's try this one more time. I think that one was a little more visible. You can actually see it pop out. So that's kind of cool just to see how that works because usually you don't see the innards. And of course this piece is inside the furnace so you're not going to see that. But this is actually the first time for me as well seeing how this works on the inside. So I thought that was pretty neat.